It's not Emily or Ellie, but it's the best I can do until the end of September. Hello, and welcome to, or back to, my channel. I'm Kit, and today, Just Pearly Things interviewed Paul Elam. Before we get into it, I would like to note that I don't know Pearl or Paul, and these are my thoughts and opinions on the content they put out for public consumption. That being said, thank you for clicking on this video, and I would like to give extra thanks to my patrons. Links to my socials and Patreon are below, along with sources and resources, and now, on to the reason we're all here. Red Pill Grifter Just Pearly Things, who seems to be trying to rebrand as Just Pearl, interviewed Paul Elam for her network and gave us some roughly 10 minute teasers. They touched on a lot of topics, judging from the titles of these videos, but we're not going to go through them all. Just a few that stood out to me and a few questions I had. And for those unfamiliar with Paul, he's the founder of men's rights website, A Voice for Men, which claims the following objectives in order of importance. To engage in reasoned peaceful advocacy, to eliminate gynocentrism and male disposability, to resolve certain issues facing men and boys, to achieve a quality of opportunity for all, to oppose enforcement of gender roles. They also have their own wiki, which informs me that gynocentrism refers to a dominant or exclusive focus on women in theory or practice, or to the advocacy of this. Anything can be considered gynocentric when it is concerned exclusively with a female point of view. From the sounds of it, where one would normally discuss patriarchy, they've swapped in gynocentrism. As for Paul himself, he also offers his services as a coach, where you can book him for help with relationship issues, self-worth slash respect, divorce strategy, smoking cessation, life goals, addictions, family of origin issues, and adjusting to red pill life. I'm not sure what qualifies him to coach anyone, but moving on. He also has a comment policy on his website, and I would like to take this moment to remind everyone that I also have commenting guidelines on my channel. Be respectful, bigotry isn't welcome here, and I'm not interested in bad faith, mis- or disinformation, or gish galloping. And if you're wondering where I'm getting my sources from, my sources, as mentioned before, are linked in the description box. Speaking of which, I did try to find Paul and Pearl's sources, since it's hard to understand where someone is coming from without it, but they didn't bother to link anything. However, after the multitude of ways in which you can give Pearl money, I found this disclaimer. Everything on this channel is comedy or satire. I thought Pearl was serious about standing up for men and boys. Does Paul know he's giving this interview to a comedy channel? I think he's serious, and at that, I think his sources are his clients. I couldn't prove this in a study, but I can tell you over and over again the men I've counseled. Paul doesn't seem to realize that, perhaps, he might attract a certain type of client, because he is not shy about what he sees as the root of men's problems. Women. And you found that even people that are, men that are struggling with substance abuse, it's mostly women too. Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of guys drink over bad marriages. Right. They're, they're miserable. They don't know what to do. They have children. If they get a divorce, they're worried about, you know, sometimes the, the wife is abusive and the, the man won't leave because they won't, don't want to leave the children right. with an abusive mother and they already know the courts are going to give her custody. Right. So they stay and they drink or they drug, or they engage in other risky behaviors, or they have affairs. Eventually, they blow up and slap her or something like that, and then that sets problems into motions. Another part of that scenario is guys that are in relationships with women that are psychologically and emotionally very abusive, which like borderline personalities are. They can be horrendously abusive yeah. people. A guy will take that abuse for years, and then one day he can't take it anymore, and he slaps her. That's all the world will ever see is the moment Correct. he slapped her. They won't pay any attention to anything that led up to it. Nothing else matters. He hit a woman. Women drive men to drink, cheat, use drugs, violence. And if you're wondering how men end up in such volatile relationships, that's also because of women. And do you think this starts for men from childhood? Like, where do you think this comes from? This, you know, because we were talking about it earlier, this... Uh, just the simping, like they just want to appease women all of the time. Well, look at your average family or mm -hmm. people from my generation grew up in homes where it was an edict, you better make your mother happy. Right. If mother complains to father, you're in trouble. Paul theorizes that men learn to appease women from their mothers and then they go to school where their teachers are also women and so they carry that appease women into their adult relationships. I am very curious about how Paul teaches men to build up their self-respect because throughout this video, the running theme is that women are the worst and men's failure is not vetting them thoroughly. 
If you look at the population of women out there, average emotional intelligence is about 14 years old, no matter how old they are in real life, mm-hmm. it, on a good day. Look at the state of women right now. How many, what percentage of women are even marriageable? Uh, right 3% now. statistically, if you want no tattoos, no debt, and <laughs> and under the age of 35, I think. Yes, and... and <laughs> there's, there's a couple more they added into it, but it was like in the book of numbers, like not overweight, no other kids. <laughs> 3%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it becomes a man's job, and here's the, the problem. Men have to man up and marry these whores. If yes, of the course they do. That's, yeah. a, that's the right thing to do, and that's what they've been doing, which is why, you know, half of the marriages are failing, and then yeah. 70% of second marriages are failing failing. It's a failure of men Mm -hmm. in my book. Pearl was a little too ready with that answer. But anyway, women, regardless of their age, have an emotional intelligence age of 14 and only 3% are worth marrying. And apparently, a woman worth marrying has to be younger than a certain age, have no tattoos, and no debt. None of which actually indicates a person's character. And Paul knows character is important. He allows that there are strong, independent women out there who would be good partners, and he encourages men to vet potential partners. Women's bullshit is so open and on display. You can't not see it if you're looking for it. I tell men all the time, you have to test women. See if she's even this vindictive. Just the tiniest amount of vindictiveness early on tells you that vindictiveness will be multiplied by a million down the road once the infatuation's over and you're in a a real relationship and it goes south, you're going to see vindictiveness out of that person. But men look at women and figure out, is she attracted to me or not? Mm -hmm. And if she is and I'm attracted to her, that's all I need to know. Mm -hmm. And then down the road, they're writing me or booking with me saying, I don't know what happened. Mm-hmm. It's a terrible problem, but you have to look. You have to look. How does she handle money? What's her debt like? Um, debt, okay. Yes. I want to know her credit score. Mm-hmm. I want to know how much debt she has. I want to know her spending habits, her, her interests. I want to know how she handles pressure. I want to know how she handles no. And here's the the problem, as we've been discussing. Gynocentrism means there is no no. Right. And so men have to actually rebel against all their life's programming to do one simple thing, to tell her no to something. So how would a guy test early on for vindictiveness? Because one thing I hear from men is that after the marriage, after the kids, the women change? And I would think you they do, do after kids mm-hmm. some, but again, I'm just, I never did buy the, she was an angel, <laughs> and, and then yeah. one day she was a demon spawn. Mm-hmm. I don't buy that. Mm-hmm. It's there. They didn't test her. They didn't push. Look at, ask her or tell her no to something. If she wants to go see a movie, just say, no, I'm not into it tonight. And then you watch very carefully what she does. Does she get huffy about it? Can she handle a no? Can she handle a no to not spending money? Mm. Does she want something? I want a three-carat diamond, whatever. Mm-hmm. No, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. What, what does she behave like then? She'll tell you who she is. Mm-hmm. She'll show you. Does she feed into the idea of a relationship where a guy's running around trying to make her happy all the time, like a trained seal, clapping his flippers, trying to get a piece of fish. Is that the setup she wants? Because if she, if that's what she wants and that's what you're providing, there's two problems. There's her and there's you. Am I womaning wrong? Men have told me no before, and that's normal. What's not normal is testing someone or pushing someone trying to get a reaction out of them. Just be honest. If you don't want to see a movie or that movie, say it. If you're not into diamond rings, say it. Ask questions. Observe. Notice how they treat people who aren't you. Don't brush off red flags. Don't think you can somehow change someone into being better. Don't think you can somehow change someone into wanting what you want. Be okay with being single so you don't end up in a bad relationship for the sake of being in a relationship. And on that note, not really, I just want to say something real quick. Explain that a little more, treat her like a guy. Same standards. Yeah. Guys will take 
shit from women that they would punch a man in the mouth for. Right. Constantly. They do that. Without they, and I'm not, no, for somebody says Paul Elam's recommending punching yeah. women in the mouth. I'm not recommending any such thing. But just the capacity to hear a crazy unrealistic expectation, like I want a three-carat emerald cut VS1 diamond for an engagement ring. Guys don't have the ability, or they should have the ability, to say, the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Go buy one. I, I did a show, and a girl wanted a $200,000 engagement ring for an overweight, like, 33-year-old woman. And I'm like, two for... I mean, at least be like 22, you know, and hot. If you're going to ask for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, at least you got to be a seven or a higher at least. Which I've got I'm a not... better idea. No ring. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. No nothing. Yeah. First, maybe, just maybe, men shouldn't be so quick to violence with one another. But this is a very important point. Men and women are people and you should have enough self-respect to have standards, to have boundaries, whether the person in question is a friend or romantic partner. A romantic partner shouldn't get a pass to treat you badly just because. Second, it's so interesting to me that Pearl thinks if a woman is young and hot, she can demand things that would otherwise be unrealistic. I assume this is unintentional, but a lot of things that Pearl says makes me think she believes women are for sale, and the younger and more attractive they are, the higher a price they can ask. And I assume it's also unintentional that she makes men sound shallow. Really, what is this? Matrimony, you know, so they don't call it patrimony. Mm -hmm. Ma marriage, matrimony used to signify a time when a woman put aside being a child and became an adult responsible for a family. She had to produce, she had to do all kinds of things. She had to take care of children. She had real responsibilities and real work. And then when we brought romance into it, the object right. became, oh, you don't have to work. You We just put a cushion under your butt and you can enjoy life that way. I saw two job postings. One was a fireman for 22 an hour and one was a, it was like a diversity and inclusion officer for 22 an hour. And I thought, like, if that's, so if you're as a family, one of you has to work, it would kind of make sense for her to. Because, I mean, what, he's going to risk his life every day or you get to go sit in an air-conditioned office doing nothing for eight hours. You can't do that. It's not like working at a farm 100 years ago. <laughs> now, how, I'm, I mean, I think you make perfect sense. Yeah. How far would that go with the average woman? Oh, no, no, they would get so mad. It would end right then and there. Yeah, well, and I think it's different if women, if we, if we came to the table with at least youth and maybe six kids, like back in the, it would make sense for us to stay home, but it's like, we're offering one to two kids. They're in public school. We're getting married around 30. So why is there no compromise? It doesn't make sense to me. In what universe does the average man want six kids? It really strikes me how Pearl and friends so often mistake their observations for the gospel truth. She saw an ad for a firefighter and a DEI officer for the same wage, so why wouldn't women work? Women would be outraged at the thought. What are they even on about? The majority of women work, yes, even after the invention of romance. And there's no way these two don't know that firefighter and DEI officer aren't the only jobs on offer. But it's really... Well, I expected nothing less, but it's still really weird how everything comes back to women being awful, which makes me doubt how much Paul really helps with self-worth slash respect. And what would you say are the common problems that men come to you with? Um, they've been screwed over by women. Everything comes back to women with Paul, and I really hope Paul's coaching involves getting men to develop a sense of self outside of a relationship independent of women, without fueling a resentment of women. We'll never know, and I have doubts, but I hope. And now to change things up, let's hear about the other thing that screws men over, family court. And what's the first thing, one of the first things that family law attorneys do when they get a new client? I need to see all your assets. We want to see what you're worth. And they calculate how much of that stuff they can get before the divorce is over. So if I, let's just say someone's worth $100,000, how would that? They will take the case, bleed that money down, and when the money is out, they'll say, okay, we've got a settlement now. Almost every divorce is a nightmare story. Uh, a guy gets financially eviscerated, they're 
Often the cases in family courts are based on false accusations. The first thing family law attorneys do, particularly with women, is saying, I think he hit you, didn't he? Uh, and, and until they get that yes, and then once that goes out, the police will investigate. Most of the time they find there hadn't been an assault here, there's no charges. But by that time, the court has the accusation and they issue ex parte restraining orders and everything else just based on the accusation. No proof whatsoever. And the family courts are just, just they're the biggest rollback of civil rights since Jim Crow in this country. The, the way they just step on families, destroy them. They, they have an opportunity in family courts, if they were doing their job, to help a family restructure post-divorce to keep the relationships intact with the children and both parents and, and to make rulings according to what is really in the best interest of the child. They don't do that at all. They destroy children in family courts and they destroy the fathers and ultimately the mothers by selling them a, a bill of goods. Attorneys purposely bleed their male clients' finances? That sounds illegal. And they push women to accuse their exes of abuse? That not only sounds illegal, but it is illegal. From Spodek Law, a list of legal risks if you make a false accusation against your ex. Defamation, malicious persecution, perjury, filing a false report, restraining order abuse, and loss of child custody. I really, really doubt there's an epidemic of attorneys out there pushing their female clients to make false accusations. That would be incredibly stupid. As for family court itself, roughly 10% of cases go to court. And I want to add this video from the account Expatriarch, where he responds to the Dadvocate, about men seeking custody. Now, Lauren has only a single source to dispute the Massachusetts gender bias study, which she presents as a paper written by Mark Rosenthal. Except that it's not a paper, it's an article that Rosenthal wrote on his own website. Rosenthal is also not a researcher, but a software engineer like myself. And he was a speaker at the International Conference on Men's Issues in 2019. And that conference is run by A Voice for Men, an anti-feminist group the Southern Poverty Law Center has declared a hate group, largely because they advocate for violence against women, and their founder, Paul Elam, has openly defended grape culture. So I think we need to be careful about how we represent this. It is not an independently peer-reviewed study or paper, but a blog article written by an MRA misogynist with ties to a hate group. Now, Rosenthal obtains the data that the Massachusetts study is based on, and it's important to point out here that that data set does not dispute anything that is in the Massachusetts study. When we look at fathers who ask for custody, they get sole or joint legal custody in 84% of cases. But Rosenthal is not happy with these numbers, so he fudges the math. He drops joint custody entirely from consideration and focuses only on sole custody, saying that when fathers seek custody, they get sole custody 45% of the time. But when mothers seek custody, they get sole custody 74% of the time, which he then uses as the headline for his article, that mothers' requests for sole custody are granted 65% more than fathers' requests, or about one and two thirds. But as I've covered before, men self-report that their wives are four times more likely to be the primary caretaker of their children than they are. When we look at stay-at-home parents, again, mothers are four times more likely to be the stay-at-home primary caretaker of their children than fathers. And when we look at census data and custodial parents, again, mothers are four times more likely to be the custodial parent than fathers. The family courts are assigning sole custody to mothers, not at four times, but not even at twice the rate of fathers, shows an incredible bias towards fathers. To put this another way, men who contest custody are twice as likely to walk out of court being the primary caretaker than they were walking in. Which then brings me to Lauren's next point. Where the study still definitively concludes that mothers get sole physical custody 65% more often than dads, only to cherry pick the facts so that only your narrative is supported, then push this as some irrefutable nationwide fact. Now Lauren misspeaks here and means legal custody, not physical custody. But on her other point about cherry picking a single data source, ignoring all else just to reaffirm your own narrative, it's important to remember that Rosenthal's article here doesn't dispute any of the claims that Massachusetts study makes. Not only that, but it only deals with one study. The Massachusetts report actually cites five studies in order to make its case. A study of law professionals that show that fathers get sole or joint physical custody 94% of the time. The Middlesex study that Rosenthal uses that shows that men get some form of legal custody 84% of the time. A second study from Middlesex County that shows that men get some form of legal custody 79% of the time. 
A study from LA County in California that shows that men get sole custody 63% of the time, as well as a nationwide study that shows that men get some form of custody in 51% of cases. Now, Lauren also says that the reason why Massachusetts does show a bias towards fathers is because of unique laws that it has in setting up default temporary custody orders for joint custody, and that no other state has these laws, which is why this trend isn't replicated in other states. But that's not correct. The Massachusetts study itself points to data from California and nationwide, which also shows this trend. But Massachusetts was not the only state to conduct a gender bias study, like Florida, for example. And what they found was not only a disturbing trend of fathers to contest custody, not for custody of the kids, but in order to gain an advantageous property settlement, but that when men did contest for custody, they were largely successful. Next up, Maryland, where 85% of judges said that fathers get a fair and serious hearing where they said that anti-father bias is more a reflection of social bias discouraging men from seeking custody than any evidence of a judicial bias, and that when men did overcome this and seek custody, they got a fair and serious hearing. Not only that, but courts were actively biased towards involved fathers and gave them greater deference. Meanwhile, mothers were unfairly punished if they wanted to work or if they had a new partner, and that all these factors gave men a greater advantage and bias in family custody cases. Now on to New York which found the same biases as Maryland, where involved fathers were given greater deference, meanwhile mothers were punished for wanting to work or having new relationships. Which is why the Civic Research Institute, when they surveyed all of the literature on child custody, pointed out that overall, over 40 states and numerous district courts had commissioned studies into gender bias, and that these had found unanimously a pervasive bias against mothers. In fact, so pervasive was this bias that when Florida's task force was commissioned to start their study, they skipped the question of if gender bias exists, saying that this has already been well established. And when taken overall, these studies show that gender bias does sometimes affect men, but it is overwhelmingly and disproportionately disadvantaging women. And we can see this lack of bias against men in more recent studies, such as this 2007 study into the 21st District Court in South Carolina. And what they found was that fathers who contested for custody got either sole or joint physical custody almost 60% of the time. Across total cases, that was 31% for fathers, so it almost doubled. But even that 31% is in line with the data from other studies, such as this custody exchange survey of hundreds of law professionals across every state in the country, which showed that on average fathers get about 35% of custody time. Now, why is that 35% and not 50? Well, I covered that extensively in that video, but in summary, it's because men don't do 50% of the childcare before the custody hearing. And all of this is before we even talk about the numerous studies that show an even greater bias towards fathers when they are accused of violence or when they accuse the mothers of alienation. And there are scores of those studies. Now, Lauren's absolutely correct when she implies that using a single data point from a single study to form a narrative would be reckless. But the reason why we say that the fathers who actively seek custody are often likely to get it is because there are multiple studies from multiple states across multiple decades that show this to be true. And yet here you are, Lauren, admitting that you are struggling to find any studies that show a pervasive bias against fathers and towards mothers. I highly recommend Brent's account. He's a men's advocate that actually advocates for men. Back to Paul, I'm so curious as to what he thinks is the reason for divorce. He mentions most divorces being filed after seven or eight years, which, according to him, is also when men hit their peak earning potential, so I assume he thinks it's just women wanting money, but only 10% of divorces involve alimony, with 7% of the recipients being women, and the top three reasons typically seem to be lack of commitment, infidelity, and too much conflict. Anyway, Enough about divorce, let's talk about gynocentrism. What is gynocentrism? Good question. <laughs> it's a, it, on paper, gynocentrism is just a system of beliefs and attitudes and rules that focus on the well-being of women over the well-being of men. There, we are, our attention and energy is focused on making women happy, keeping them safe, giving them what they want. Um, it goes back oh gosh, at least a thousand years, mm -hmm. to the advent of romantic chivalry, which is a big part of modern gynocentrism. You know, gynocentrism itself, historically, wasn't such a bad thing. If, we, if women weren't alive to have children, right. <laughs> yeah. we would have been in trouble. And they had to be able to protect children and nurture them and get them to where they were self-sufficient. So there was a certain amount of gynocentrism 
was absolutely uh, an imperative for the human species. But once romantic chivalry hit the mainstream throughout Europe and then eventually in the West, it was more than keeping women alive. It was about keeping that smile on their face Mm -hmm. all the time. And if we fail, then there's a problem. And that's what led to a lot of simping. So gynocentrism was about keeping women alive, examples please, until romantic chivalry came around, examples please, and now gynocentrism is about keeping women happy. And again, I would like some examples of these beliefs, attitudes, and rules that are about making women happy. And at that, at least we get one. Anybody should be able to look at that image of a guy down on his knees bearing a diamond saying, this is how I want our life to be as totally unsustainable. Right. But it doesn't even enter our minds. We're just like, oh no, she's smiling. Because it's been programmed into us for like a thousand years. Exactly. Paul is reading too much into the gesture. Kneeling when proposing doesn't mean supplicating yourself to that person for the rest of your lives. It's a gesture, not a blood oath. And that seems to be what gynocentrum is, at least as Paul describes it. Gestures that make women smile, but that don't actually do anything for women. There is, however, one thing I agree with Paul on. And I think this goes back to tradcon men really getting things confused. They, they want children, not women. They want somebody to take care of and, to, and I think in their mind, somebody they can control. No arguments there. Paul also said that trad cons infantilize women by suggesting they can't accomplish anything. And I also agree with that. And that's where our agreements end. As I mentioned before, Paul and Pearl seem to confuse reality with fiction and take Paul's clients as peer reviewed research. And their conclusions feel half formed. Women have an easy life because ad campaigns in the 1950s showed women shopping or at the hair salon. Gynocentrism is a thing because there are paintings showing a knight kneeling before a lady, therefore all women were revered. There are stories of courtly love, therefore that is what romance is. Their conclusions are shallow, lacking insight or thought into how life actually is and was for the majority of people, currently and historically. If they understand nuance, they don't practice it, and they don't encourage thinking. They just make things as simple and palatable as possible for their intended audience. And well, it works, but is it going to change anything? How does painting women as shallow and emotionally immature yet malicious creatures do anything for men? What is the purpose of this content? I'm going to skip my usual outro and just remind everyone that I have resources below for men's groups, non-tradcon Instagram accounts, reading lists, and so on. And I don't think I've mentioned this in a video, but every quarter I post on the community tab asking for nonprofit recommendations to donate to, and then we vote to see where the AdSense funds for that quarter goes. You can see past donations in the description box as well, and Q3 ends in about five weeks if you're watching this the day it goes live. And good night, or morning, or afternoon, 